Welcome to the Working Genius Podcast, where we discuss anything and everything related to the six types of working genius and how it impacts your work and your life. I'm Pat Lincioni, your host, joined by Bo and Cody, otherwise known as Bodie. How are you guys doing today? Swell. All right, we got the two dudes on yeah, the mic. excited to be here. Tracy's on vacation. Matt is in studio. Karen is here. She's the... You know, don't pay no attention to the woman behind the curtain. She's the one telling me what to say. So what are we going to talk about today, Cody? We're going to do a fun one, Pat. We're calling it activity dissection. That's right. We're going to dissect an activity, maybe more than one, where we look at how different working genius types interact and around doing that activity. We're going to talk about how would this play out based on different pairings, different geniuses and all that. And... Bo, what is the first activity we're going to dissect? Ooh, let's talk about an escape room. Right, escape rooms. I think some people call it panic rooms. I think that's a, an activity too, although that's a kind of a different thing. But escape rooms are those places where a bunch of people go in like at an activity and they have to read the rules and they have to solve a puzzle to get out of the room by a certain time. And if they don't, they fail. And it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Most of us have done it. Somebody in our office has ever done it, but she took her daughter and watched her daughter and her friends do it at a birthday party. And so I think most people listening to this know what an escape room is, and it's fun. It is fun, mm-hmm. but it's more fun for different people, and different people play very different roles when they go there. Maybe we could have one of you kind of summarize in 30 seconds what happens at an escape room. So often they're like a themed room. Like you might go into one where the theme is you have to solve a crime or you have to, there's a file on the desk and it's about a mission that you have to accomplish. So there's a different, a series of, of puzzles or, or even clues or, you know, hints towards getting the ultimately getting unlocked from the room. So basically a series of activities that you have to do together as a team, collectively solve these mysteries and they subsequently lead you to the next mystery, which ultimately should lead to you getting out of the room. And there's a time element to it. So they might say, hey, you have 90 minutes to complete this escape room. And the idea is that you collaborate together to ultimately solve all the puzzles and get out of the room. It's usually like eight to 10 people, six to 10 people, right? And I did one where it was a, we had to, I think, rob a bank or something or solve a bank robbery or something like that or Hmm. all that kind of stuff. Very good, Cody. Wonderful. So you get people in a room to do this based on their geniuses and their pairings. What are going to be the best types? How are they going to play out in all of this? I'm an ID. Okay. I know that discernment is probably important for for doing this because you got to kind of look at things and make decisions of how does this work. I do not understand whether or not my invention serves me in any way. And frankly, I would say I'm a laggard when it comes to being in an escape room. I'm not the best person on the team. I would imagine that Matt, as a wanderer, is going to say, why are we doing this escape room in the first place? But <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I wonder, and, it, and it's not necessarily about saying like, oh, in the escape room, the most, the most important genius is discernment. But it is worth exploring no. like how would invention or wonder play into mm. a collaborative effort to get out of that room. Well, and well, let's start with the beginning. Wonder, I think, is actually really important. I do too. Because it's, 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 first of all, it's not disruptive. It's responsive. And they're like, I wonder, mm. I, do you think there's some meaning to that hint over there or right. that clue or the way they wrote this? Why did they use that font? I, I wonder if there's a, a reason for that. Yep. Yeah, because they're not first giving you like, hey, do this crossword puzzle. They're putting you in a room often. I've only been in a couple of these and you're looking for patterns. You're looking for something that maybe isn't normal or perhaps an opportunity. And what I've actually been in a room, Pat, where we, where somebody did this, they started drilling in too deep into a specific nuance. Yes. And what we needed to do is pull back and say, well, what about this? Or what, or what do you notice in this environment? I want to ask Matt, Matt, you've done some of these. Does that make sense? Does wonder ask the right questions oftentimes? I think so. I think when I do them, I want everybody else to slow down. And I mean, I haven't done one since the Working Genius was born, so I don't know what it's like to do it while in the context of Working Genius. But I can imagine I would want to sit back and be patient and ask questions before. 
And there's probably t- people with tenacity. They're like, hey, we got we got 20 minutes. Let's go. We got to do this. Come on, you go do it. You know, or, or there might be a galvanizer doing that. And the wonder might go, hey, wait, are we missing something here? And I'll say like, I, I think that even as we it started this conversation, I'm like that we didn't set ourselves up for this this thing. But I think like, I do believe that all of the six types would be helpful, useful, required for solving that. And I think like that, that example you just gave, Pat, is the first step is probably a little bit of curiosity and noticing the environment would be better than jumping right to galvanizing or mm-hmm. tenacity, which is like, mm-hmm. hey, let's just open up all the th- drawers that you can and see what we can find. I think there's the, the order of operations, it would probably lend itself to a more successful team collaborating in that room. I think you're right. What I say, I think it requires them all, except the one I can't figure out because I'm one of those, but I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong. But I don't know what an inventor would do in there because it's so much about seeing what's already done. So Bo is an inventor like me, so maybe he can tell us. But first of all, somebody needs to go, what's really going on here? Do we really understand this? Have we really st- stepped back and looked at this? And I, I would say, Pat, the, the way I would answer your question is, you know, the next question might be, okay, so now we've observed the room. We kind of know the theme. We, we think that we have, you know, the, here's the time frame that we're in. Where should we start? An inventor might have some really good ideas of like, well, maybe we should, you know, we should start over here in this corner of the room for this reason. You know, like I think even just throwing ideas against the wall so that then we ah. can quickly go to discernment to go, well, maybe not that. That feels like it might be further down the line. Or so I, I do think that it quickly moves from invention discernment loop is probably happening a lot in that room to solve that puzzle. That, that makes sense. What do you think, Bo? Yeah, and the individual puzzles, if I remember correctly, a lot of those you need somebody who's being, well, what about this? What about this? You could, you know, if it's a jumble of letters and you've got to come up with different words that that could spell or potential solutions to a problem, we're pretty good at coming up with rapid fire. It could be, it could be, it could be that that can help disrupt that environment and keep things moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll accept that. I'll accept that. So we have a wonderer that's making sure we're asking their questions, noticing things, maybe the inventor's throwing stuff up against the wall. Then what's going on? This is a, this is a great place where th- th- this is accidentally turning into a really good example. Maybe you guys knew it was to begin with is this yeah, is a great example. Yeah, we knew of, that. Sure. <laughs> of where you could jump to the end to try to find the way to push the door open and finish the get across the finish line. And this is a place where doing things in the right order, discernment now helps you actually stay on track. Knowing what's the right solution and the right next step will help you be able to get out of that room faster. But it might feel in the moment like what you should be doing is pressing on the walls and trying to find the secret key. But the room's designed for you to do this in order. And discernment is the genius that knows when we've made the right decision and what's the right next step. I think it also has to do with what we say about curation with the discerners. I remember I was always worried that somebody else was going to root through the wrong drawer and lose something that we needed later, like a key or a ball or something small. So I would always be the guy that was like kind of assembling all the things that we had found with numbers or keys or anything that seemed relevant on it in the middle of the room, just so we didn't lose any of it. And I mean, if, ah. if there, I'm, I'm sure there were times where if we didn't have somebody doing that, we would have lost something or dropped a key into a drawer and not been able to like stay on track going down the line. Yeah. This is so interesting because one of the observ- or one of the thoughts I'm having, because I'm actually remembering the one time I've done an escape room is we just talked about the order of these things, but I remember, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to pose a question to you guys. I'm interested at how you'll respond. It did feel like the escape room I was in, it's almost as if someone needed to galvanize first, like gal- like galvanize in the sense of, hey guys, there's going to be an order to this and we need a little bit of like, we, we need a structure in how we're going to do this. It, rather than, I remember like three different groups of three going into different corners of the room and finding clues out of order. And, and so I wonder if galvanizing can actually come first as like a, you kind of need a leader, right? You need like a, or someone that at mm-hmm. least is, is rallying people in the same direction or in the same sequence. Right. And that's so interesting, Cody, because I was about to say too, that I think galvanizing is critical, but if you're galvanizing toward completion versus, this might be where a WG is helpful, <laughs> but, but, and I don't know what the pairing would be, but you definitely need somebody to galvanize, but to galvanize with patience and with 
an overall perspective rather than driving people to just get things done. Hmm. Hmm. And maybe a DG w- w- is, a, is a great combo for that. I remember when I was in the escape room that we've done, or the first one that we did, being very frustrated. We had a group of 10, we were doing a team building thing, and one person kind of took the reins and thought, what this group needs is some leadership, and everybody follow me. And it was a great reminder, we all experienced this in school, in class projects, is there is disruption that's needed, but often the insight and wisdom is in people who are more responsive And what a leader needs to do is make sure we're getting the discernment, enablement, wonder from the more responsive geniuses, rather than just saying, push, drive, follow me. We can figure this out. We can muscle our way to the end. Yeah. Karen, you just mentioned it's galvanizing the people and their skill sets and using them the right way, not just getting people to do things or to take charge. So definitely, so far, I think you've made the case that we need wonder, we need invention, we need discernment, of course, in that loop. We need galvanizing, though. Somebody, somebody has to be good at pulling it all together. But I'll tell you what, if you don't have people enabling, it's a poop show. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. If there's not somebody that says, okay, I'll take on that task, and, and they, they assign it to them, they say, we need somebody to do that, and somebody doesn't say, I'll do that, versus I don't want to do that one, I want to do this one, it's over. Mm-hmm. So you've got to have people with enablement mm. who will receive their their call to action and embrace it and go for it. Yeah, Bo. And that galvanizing enablement relationship helps prevent silos, helps prevent the group from getting frustrated because the galvanizer is keeping everybody, hey, we can do this, we're together, and I have galvanizing, I don't have enablement. Great enablers, and we work with so many of them, help make sure people are included, help make sure we're taking the right first steps and that, that the people are seen and involved, that we're not just finishing the task, leaving people behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I was on a working genius call earlier today where somebody said the, the talent of your genius is just important, just as important as the timing of your genius. Like we talk about the order of operations here, but like the idea of, and I do this, not just in escape room, sometimes in meetings or with clients where, you know, we all love our own elevation. So I'll go right to discerning and galvanizing before I've ever wondered what the problem Mm -hmm. is or invented what possible solutions are. So the the idea that this happens in a sequence and that you're all, you know, this is sort of inadvertently turning into like a a teamwork episode, but I think that's the essence of working genius, which is like, boy, if you, if you go into that room and you think individual geniuses are going to solve the puzzle more effectively or faster you're way wrong as opposed to, hey, let's sequence these and use people's skill set in the right order. And you get all the way to tenacity and it will be, you'll probably get out a lot faster. Mm. We've not talked explicitly about tenacity. I'm sure we will. I think an escape room is also a great sort of picture or metaphor for sometimes things need to be, we need to go back higher in elevation. We might have thought that we're to the phase of galvanizing enablement and we realize, oh, we hit a dead end. We actually need to, we need to go back and maybe re-wonder, maybe we need to re-discern because we sort of hit a dead end. Does that resonate with yeah. you guys? Oh, yeah. you got to, and, and in, in this case, you have to go back to W sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think that tenacity, and this is true in life, people, we haven't talked about it because you always need tenacity. You need yeah. that person that goes, I'm going to sit here and figure this puzzle out if it's the last thing I do, you know, because they're like not going to give up. But it's so interesting. You need them all. My question would be this. What would be the one letter, if you didn't have that one letter, you'd be most worried? Like you, a bunch of people get in a room and everybody's like, okay. And everybody had the same letter as a frustration. Which of, it, which of them do you think would be the biggest problem? I think it depends on the activity. Well, because we're talking about an escape room, the answer that I had might surprise you. You're going to an escape room because you kind of want to, build a team, you want to connect with people, you want to leave closer than when you got in. And I think (laughs) enablement. I think that it would be very easy for one of those things to make a family reunion miserable, (laughs) but enablement could be the thing that makes it be able to stay cohesive and connected. Right. So you answered the the better question, but but if I were to say, how about if the the job was just to get out as fast as you could, who could perform the best? But you're right. (laughs) Probably if that's your goal, when you do an escape room, you're already in big trouble. But let's just say we were like, we're doing this to see who could do the best job. 
who would you need? What pairing, what single one? I mean, I don't know the answer. We don't know where we're going here. But what do you think? Matt, you have an idea. I think it'd be D or G. Just because if everybody's kind of on the same page, like Cody said, there was three different groups of three all on different pages and trying to find clues at the same time and not working together. Like it's a linear thing, an escape room. You find a clue which opens a box or a lock or something and then you open a door and then it goes, it's completely linear. And so if you're not all on the same page, which is pretty much what D and G, the activation geniuses do, then mm -hmm. I think you would just end up taking a lot longer. Thank right. you, Matt. That means a lot. Appreciate you saying those kind words about me. So. <laughs> yeah. So not if the a job, were, though, just D or G. <laughs> if the if the job were just to get out, I think I can see a D G, and I want some W, and some T and some E. Yeah, I think the I is just the one. I'd be like, I'd be okay if there were no eyes in the room. Mm -hmm. You, you know what's interesting as I think about this, I, I actually remember our escape room opened up into another, you know, room that we were in at one point. And, and as we we're thinking about this, I'm thinking like, okay, so what's actually true about those rooms is we all do the thing that we enjoy most, you know, like because of working genius. Like I remember yeah. a wall of all these cupboards that you could open and one of the, there's a clue in one of the cupboards and, and what I, I was looking at the wall and thinking, I want to figure out the right door to open to get to the clue. And then there was another person in the, the group that probably had tenacity. Now, this is like, you know, eight years ago. So I don't know. I, we didn't have working genius, but who's literally just went up and started opening all the doors and just like, I'm going to check these off by looking in every single one of them mm. because that's yeah. the way that they approach the enjoyment of that is like, I'm going to check all these versus I really wanted to take a step back and discern, oh, I want to figure out the puzzle and select the right one, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. I think I wanted to come up with one myself. Like, ooh, you know what? I think I have an idea. Oh, we could too. do one. You know, I wanted to invent a new one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think would be the most frustrating to have overrepresented. I agree with you, Matt. I was actually thinking a, the, a DG is a great type to keep the group going, keep it moving. But if a room, if everybody had discernment in that room, I think it would be painful because it might be living in the phase of let's keep talking about it. Let's keep talking about it and never moving to completion. That could be maybe enjoyable for everybody except me who's ready to keep moving. <laughs> Stop talking about the decision. Everybody's like, but I have an idea. I have a thought about this. Yeah. Over-representation of D can really slow things down. Yeah. And, and, and this is what I love about the the parameters of this example is like, there is a time limit. A bunch of discerners yeah. would definitely, they might figure it out, but not in the right amount of time. So the, the sort of symbiotic relationship between the responsiveness of discernment, but the pushing of invention or galvanizing or tenacity. I think this is why it's fun to talk about this stuff. Yeah. And you know, what's key is that more than anything, whatever the makeup is, it's do the other people know what they don't have and do they mm. trust the people to exercise their geniuses when they're necessary. Hmm. You know, in other words, there are times when it's like, oh, you have tenacity, you're going to plow through this. I want to trust you to do that. Oh, you have wonder, I'm going to listen to your questions. Oh, you have galvanizing, I'm going to let you take charge right now. You know, letting other people live in their geniuses and being glad for those is probably a bigger indication than just the makeup itself. I'm so glad you said the, the, and be glad, as I think, and to be able to celebrate and take joy in somebody else winning. Because so, escape rooms have lots of different puzzles along the way. And if you, if you can enjoy and celebrate other people contributing, you'll have a great experience. But if it is only, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm knocking up my own individual wins, I'm keeping score of how I was able to help, it will ultimately be frustrating, which is how, again, to every, Cody, team. every team is that way. That's right. That's so funny. I mean, we weren't thinking about doing this as a, as a, you know, allegory for teamwork and the five dysfunctions. But the truth of the matter is, if all you want to do is get out, have fun, and celebrate one another's skills, it's going to be great. If you think mm. you have to prove yourself or, or, or prove that you're better than somebody else, then it is going to suck. And sometimes escape rooms suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes they do. All right. All righty. Is that the end of our conversation? I think it's pretty interesting, oh, right? We're going to take on... To to one activity. We're going to we're going to do one in the future. We're going to talk about going camping Let's and how go. this plays out. And we had an interesting 
conversation about that. And I think that'll be a, it's an, an entirely other show. So we'll join us for that one. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us on this podcast, Working Genius. And we'll talk to you next time. God bless. Thank you.